Thanks very much, Terry, for that um, generous introduction. And I do have to say that it may seem altruistic, but actually a lot of what I do is, um, it gives me great pleasure as well. And it was certainly with the, um, uh, that, the Skylar, um, with Priya, it was very much a sort of two-way learning experience. So um, to be able to go to India and see her recently was fantastic. Um, okay, so today I'm talking about um, collecting and exhibiting art by women, and it's, um, I've come at this question from a number of different angles. Um, in part, it uh, feeds into my interest in, in art history, uh, my interests as a feminist, and also as um, someone who's concerned about the economics of the art world and the notion of uh, artistic labour and the way we attach value to art and artists. So, um, so I'll just sort of talk through a number of themes really under the broad topic. Um, and for me, uh, my interest arose at a particular moment when there were a significant number of international exhibitions focusing on work by women. Uh, some were very explicitly positioned as feminist exhibitions. Others really celebrated the extraordinary diversity of art produced by women. Um, the Pompidou Centre in Paris took its own idiosyncratic approach and just hauled out every bit of work in its collection that they had by women artists and sort of laid it all out there in a, a wonderful um, yeah, idiosyncratic um, exhibition. But However the work was presented, it um, made a very important point was that these were unusual circumstances to see exhibitions of work solely by women. Um, ironically, these exhibitions of work solely by women artists um, distorted the sort of figures for that period of how many works by women are shown in galleries because during those years there were a large number of works by women being shown but they were in very specific um, exhibitions. Now more recently in Australia um, we've seen a couple of uh, in, oh, numbers really but a couple of standout exhibitions and this one was at the National Portrait Gallery called So Fine Contemporary Women Artists Make Australian History. And what perhaps um, distinguished this exhibition from the ones that I referred to previously, the international exhibitions, was that this were, these were works that were commissioned by the National Portrait Gallery. So they were actually encouraging new works by living women artists and adding them to their collection. Many um, museums and galleries will put on exhibitions bringing together artworks from a range of institutions and leave perhaps their own collecting practices unchanged but with the National Portrait Gallery they went out of their way to commission works by 10 contemporary women artists and what was fascinating about them was that they also explored very different ways of presenting uh, the notion of portraiture to, to its audience and I think um, you can see this reflected in this really extraordinary piece by Lindy Ivany and um, her work in the exhibition was quite extraordinary. It was um, inspired by a trip, it celebrated Antarctic explorers and inspired by a trip there. So very complex pieces of work. Um, we also had uh, this exhibition at ACCA, Unfinished Business, Perspectives on Art and Feminism. And this was very uh, different in the sense that it was explicitly a feminist exhibition. It used the artwork, it drew on artwork that very much uh, <coughs> fed into the um, women's movement at, at, in different eras and uh, where artists had used their artwork as a way of exploring issues that were facing um, women in all areas of activity. And what I want to stress uh, is the way in which the status of women's art, uh, women's art and the status of their um, art in museums tends to reflect the general way in which women are positioned in the socio-economic sphere more generally. So it's, we often, our focus is, or my focus has very much been on women in the arts, but in fact um, there are alliances to be built with women who are working in all other areas to promote the, um, the cause of women and their um, professional aspirations. Now, um, these, these um, 
exhibitions stand, stand alone, but there are also uh, organisations and institutions that have committed themselves specifically to collecting women's art. So, as I said, um, exhibitions in national galleries and museums and specialist um, collections are one thing, but the other is organisations that have committed themselves to collecting women's art. And we have the um, Elizabeth Sackler Centre in Brooklyn Museum, and that houses uh, the dinner party, this piece on the, in the upper right-hand corner, a, uh, a monumental piece of work. I'm not sure if anyone here saw it when it was in the exhibition buildings here in Melbourne. Um, it was amazing, and it was a, a sort of catalyst for a, um, a very wide discussion, not all of it um, supportive, because there, we still, there's very much attention, I suppose, when we talk about women's artwork, we still have a sort of a sense of, um, what about Australian women's artwork? And so there's always, these are, these are very complex discussions. But nonetheless, the monumental piece by Judy Chicago came to the exhibition buildings in 1988 during the bicentennial. And um, it, this work celebrates the work of uh, women throughout the ages and they're captured in various ways around the dinner party um, through ceramic uh, crockery and also through people's names being embedded in the tiled floor in the centre. But that's now part of the Elizabeth Sackler Centre for Feminist Art. And actually last night I was just thinking, which you may have heard, those of you who are sort of reading the art newspapers, uh, will know that the Sackler family are um, major philanthropists to the arts, but they're now being um, challenged in terms of their uh, connection with the manufacturing of opioids and the um, uh, addictions, that, the suffering and consequences of this. But you'll be pleased to know that Elizabeth Sackler is not from that arm of the family. So I thought I needed to check that before um, promoting this. Um, in Australia, we have the Crothers Collection of Women's Art, which was um, really a, a deliberate um, decision on the part of uh, Sheila and Jim Crothers to be collecting work by women, acknowledging uh, that in Australia there was a the history of Australian art is um, really made up of um, particular male artists in the main, and we would constantly be hearing about these significant Australian artists. And they wanted to acknowledge that there were many women artists that were also practicing at the same time. Many of these collections have, um, and focus, have actually started to retell the story of art history in Australia and elsewhere because we very much have a, a sort of a, a discipline, a canon, a narrative of Australian art history and other national art histories. And these are being overturned or enlarged and made more sophisticated by the efforts of um, not always women, but predominantly so. Art historians actually um, not discovering, recovering, and promoting the work of women artists um, over time. Um, so, um, why is it important uh, to have these focused exhibitions? As I, um, as noted here by Elvis Richardson, who's an artist whose art practice itself is focused on this particular question about women artists. And in, 19, in 2014, this was a, um, an analysis of the artworks that were exhibited in state and national uh, museums and galleries of art in Australia, which showed that 58%, uh, 59, nearly 60% of artworks that were shown by male, were by male artists, and 34 were by female artists, and the 7% is the sort of collaborations between the two. So, this is what we're seeing in galleries and museums now, and this is, you know, we feel that we're living in, in sort of more enlightened periods, but um, one of the reasons why we have this legacy, if you like, is because of the nature of the collections in museums and art galleries. They have been built up over a long period of time. The budgets for galleries and museums these days, certainly in the public sphere, are very restricted. And so when decisions are made to purchase works, um, there may not be put in women artists at the top of that list. And I'll come back to that shortly because it is a, it's a major issue for a number of reasons. Nonetheless, we know that um, when work is shown in galleries, it does increase the value of the work. 
And this is something that um, the art market is well aware of, art collectors are well aware of. If they have a work that can be exhibited in an exhibition in a prestigious museum, the value of that work will go up because it will be said, you know, as shown in the National Gallery of Victoria or uh, National Gallery of Australia or the Met. Um, and that's happened when we've started to locate the works and, dis and uh, display them of Australian, and these are, uh, this is work from um, uh, a British, a report of a British um, auction, but Dorrit Black and um, Ethel Spowers are really significant printmakers uh, whose work was done in Australia. And um, they've received a sort of a resurgence of interest of late, and it feeds through to the value of the artwork. So just the mere focus on this work has the effect of increasing the value of the work. Um, and in so doing, I would say it's not just about sort of boosting the value of the work, if you like, but in so doing, it brings those artists into contention with some of their male counterparts and starts to rewrite the history of that period. Uh, but still there's a long way to go. So this is the sort of auction records of um, the top 100 uh, works by value at auction. And you can see that the um, green, turquoise, whatever, um, there is of works by male artists, the top being 450 million for a da Vinci. And then as we go through, I think there's one, two, three, anyway, you can see yourself um, around 10. Uh, works by women artists that are there in that top 100. So the discrepancy in value between the, um, or the let's say, yeah, the, the discrepancy in value attached to work by male artists and female artists is really extreme. Um, again, it's a, it's a complex area, but I think we can actually make it a bit more simple as to why, or one factor, as to why these really extreme differences exist in the value of male and female artists' work. Um, in fact, I've started to talk about a premium for the work of male artists because there are artists from varying, uh, one can't say minorities in relation to women, um, but let's say varying disadvantaged groups um, whose work also sells for much less than that of dead white male artists. Um, and we wonder why this is. And I think we need to start thinking about what is it, how do we value art? How do we attach value to an artwork? Um, what has been the history of, of art? And how does that influence our reception of art in the present? Now, there was a rather devastating study. Uh, this I just found gobsmacking, and it's I'm just sort of diverging from the art world for a minute. But um, some academics did some work about items that are for sale on eBay. I don't know how many of you shop on eBay. I don't, but um, I gather, so, uh, so works were for sale on eBay. And just to give you an example, all the same is Bell. So, these researchers could trawl through using these sort of amazing sort of big data analysis and they worked out that if a woman was selling this bell on eBay and a man was selling the exact same bell or product on eBay, the price that was bid for the item, the object, was higher if it was being sold by a man. I can give you the reference. Um, now this is, I mean, in some ways we think, well, how can this be? But then on the other hand, we know that women's labour has been devalued over time, or male labour has been paid a premium. So if we think about somehow it's, and what is it about? It's somehow the sort of touch of the male hand or something that gives it this higher value. And we think of that in terms of the artwork, because very much we collapse the identity of the artist with their work. And so this sort of close connection between the gender of the artist and the work, I think, is, um, makes it a very similar sort of corollary to this, this research. So there you are, the same object on eBay, sold for more when it was for sale by not just one male, but you know, thousands on, in this huge database. Um, so their conclusion was, women sellers received a smaller number of bids and lower final prices than did equally qualified male sellers of exact same products. 
The author suggested one explanation for this outcome, I think we can say quite a significant one, was that people tend to assign a lower value to products when sold by men rather than by women. So, bringing that back to the art world, it's rather depressing really, but um, it starts to explain more than the sort of critique that we hear about, oh, women's art doesn't sell for as much because I don't know they had a child, somehow that makes a difference. Um, or their you know, career was shorter or whatever. But nonetheless, if we're talking about individual artworks, they still sell for less than those of men. And some of the, um, so some of this has also been um, the subject of very rigorous research where about uh, for a team of four academics, uh, some from Australia, the Netherlands and the US, analysed cultural differences in the demand for female artists' work at auction. They drew on 1.5 million transactions across 45 countries. So again, it's the sort of work you can do when you can access large numbers of um, large stocks of data. Um, they documented a 47.6% gender discount in auction prices for paintings. So they sort of put up the hypothesis, why is this? Is it not as good art? Um, but what they did was they set up a number of experiments and um, prepared artworks themselves, uh, being one being purported to be by a man and one by a woman, and of course the one by the male artist, pretend artist, um, sold for more than a work that was by a female artist. Now, um, they did some other, they did some other um, experiments as well and concluded that the difference between the average option price of paintings of female artists versus male artists is related to variables that measure inequality between women and men in society. So having um, identified this difference in the value that was attached to artworks in different art markets, they then saw, tried to see whether it was correlated with other variables in those countries. And the degree to which um, there was a socioeconomic disadvantage between men and women in the country was mirrored in the degree to which there was the divergence in the prices the artworks fetched at auction. So this, this sort of relationship between uh, the economic position of women, the social position of women in society more generally feeds into the values that we attach to artworks by women artists. Um, their ultimate conclusion was that uh, their findings suggest, well, they said there was suggestive ed evidence that participants who are more likely to represent typical art option participants, namely affluent men, may value art by women less than art by male artists. So the point I'm, um, I'm sort of labouring here, if you like, is that it really, we, we talk about trying to get more women into the art world, we talk about trying to sort of have more recognition of women artists, but ultimately so much of the value that we attach to art by women is a reflection of the value that we attach to the status of women in the our society more generally. So. Um, my sort of conclusion from this is don't limit ourselves to um, promoting and uh, women in the art world, certainly do that, but we also need to be uh, working very much on the issue of gender equality in, the, um, in society more generally. Now, um, these difference values for male and female uh, work by male and female artists, as I said, shouldn't really come as much of a surprise. We know that women's labour is um, valued at less than men's labour. Um, but we wouldn't necessarily have thought that that affected the way um, we attach value to art by women. But we have to look again more closely at the way in which the art world attaches value to art. And we're very much, um, I suppose history or certainly since um, in the last 500 years or so, the notion of talent and creativity and expertise has very much been associated with the sort of um, the male artist as sort of um, having all the creative powers, um, having uh, talents that were not sort of uh, that were not really worldly, as if they were sort of otherworldly talents that we attached to to artists. Um, the, we sort of look at work by um, artists as being making assessments of quality, of excellence, of an aura, of authenticity, all the things that are actually very subjective, 
So we often use a proxy, namely the sort of um, artist, creative artist, creative genius, to substitute for those sort of assessments. Now, the experiment that I talked about previously was where um, the gender of the artist was hidden from someone and then they were told it was a male and they valued something more than if they were told it was by a female. Um, this is not, as I've said, unique to the um, visual arts. And in fact, in a number of areas of the arts, efforts have been made to try to counterbalance this. So those of you who may be familiar with the um, music uh, symphonies and the like, when auditions are held, uh, and again, this can only, well, it depends on what stage people are at in their careers, but certainly some symphonies now use the blind audition technique. So the idea is that there's a screen, the musician plays, the, um, the uh, orchestra itself doesn't know the gender of the musician, some go to such lengths as putting carpet on the floor so that um, you can't hear the click of heels or the stomp of boots or whatever, um, all intending to hide the gender of the musician and to ensure that the judgment that is being made is made on the, muse um, the performance itself. And there was work that was done um, to analyse the impact of that and they concluded that the screen this is screening and, and keeping the gender of the um, person auditioning from those who were recruiting. The screen increases by 50% the probability that a woman will be advanced from certain preliminary rounds into the next round. So the, the impact of, um, let's say, uh, well, entrenched bias, we might call it um, unconscious bias, but um, I think it's sort of becoming evident that this is more conscious than unconscious. Um, so the adoption of screen and blind, uh, blind auditions serves to help female musicians in their quest for orchestral positions. So how could we sort of mimic this in the art world, in the visual art world? It's very difficult to do this because um, it's about the, the style of an artist will become known. Um, and again, it's sort of the more uh, developed you are in your career, the more your particular style, even in music, your way of playing is probably known. But nonetheless, uh, for early career artists, uh, a number of prizes, and one is the uh, prize from the Newcastle Gallery, which I think is called the Kilgore, uh, the Kilgore Prize at Newcastle Gallery. It's for early career artists, and they assess those artworks blind. So the judging panel are not told the gender of the artist, and um, that sort of has produced a, an outcome whereby they've got a much more balanced, gender balance in terms of the artworks that have been selected. Ah, okay, just right, I'm right at the right place. So um, there's one further element, and when I was uh, thinking about this question more generally, I think there's something unusual about, still unusual about art, and it's the way in which the canon the canon of art, because every, we spell it wrongly all the, well, it gets spelt incorrectly a lot of the time, but the art history canon um, is very much casts a shadow over how we value the work of the present. So the canon of art history is the way in which the sort of authoritative works and, and the experts have determined the sort of narrative of art history, it represents the canon. And Art history and criticism strives to retain this disciplinary rigidity through the canon and connecting you know, current works to the canon, um, where works in the past fit into the canon. And in fact, um, these sort of categories are, are largely constructed by art historians of the past in different eras when different gender relations exist. So the, the masters and their pieces are really a constant reminder of the status of women as artists and that this really may, remains provisional because in any art history um, course that we take we are really completely um, overwhelmed you don't even you just assume that the artist is male because, that an artist is male because so much of the syllabus is around the canon which includes work by predominantly by male artists so as art historians i think um well speaking for myself as an art historian but i think more generally we need to not only be talking about valuing the work that current women artists are doing, but we also need to interrogate the canon 
and the value that we attach to work that has been um, privileged in the past and contributed to that canon. And that's where um, the whole um, network in the art world is really interrelated. The idea of exhibiting women artists improves the value of the work, that work then receives more attention, it starts getting written into the canon. We hope it's a slow process. Um, in terms of the collections held though, the canon continues to be problematic because when we have art galleries and museums that attempt to create an encyclopedic collection, and you might think of the National Gallery of Victoria as being one such museum, uh, it's always um, purported to be the place where an art history scholar or student can go and see oh, representative works from different periods in art history. Now, that um, leads to the idea on behalf of collecting institutions that they have to address this problem of the, the problem of the gap in the collection. So, at the same time as we might be trying to increase the um, value that of works um, being sold at auction by women, um, by improving the level to which art by women is exhibited in museums, we're also um, battling with this sort of ever-present notion of the canon and on the part of the major art institutions, such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a major consideration when they're purchasing new work is whether it fills a gap in the collection. Now, one might say, well, there's a huge gap, art by women artists, but when they say a gap in the collection, it's very much referring to the, um, the canon, art historical canon, the piece that's missing in the sort of presenting this singular narrative of art history. And the works that I'm showing there were each bought by galleries and museums to fill a gap in the collection. So we've got NGV uh, purchased a work by Donald Friend not so long ago to fill a gap in the collection. Uh, the work at the bottom was also purchased by the NGV, often through significant fundraising activities um, to fill a gap in the collection. And the interesting work on the right, the Frick Collection in New York purchased this work by Gerard, um, and it was only after it was purchased that it was revealed, or revealed um, the sort of, I suppose, uh, discourse around the, the purchase and the work and the celebration and the sort of wide discussion indicated that the person depicted was Napoleon's brother-in-law. Now at that stage, and the work um, was still in Europe, or had been in Europe in an Italian collection, and at that point when it was discovered that it was actually a portrait of Napoleon's brother-in-law, they tried to put an export restriction on it leaving because it suddenly became much more um, famous than it was. Um, and as, I'm not sure whether that has been resolved yet, this is only last year that that purchase occurred, so it may still be the subject of some legal action. But the this, these are all illustrative of the sorts of works that uh, large amounts of money are being spent through public fundraising to purchase works to fill a gap in the collection when I think the consensus is that the most significant gap in most galleries and museums is that of um, representation of works by women artists. So on, just to hone in slightly more, um, last year, the um, National Gallery of Victoria's uh, annual appeal was to purchase a Dali. Again, uh, a gap in the collection. Now, um, I can understand, you know, why why this occurs. It's um, it is consistent with the sort of story of art history that various artists are prominent and they represent particular um, shifts and movements in in the history of art. But I think we need to question really um, what the future means for women artists and for retrieving those significant artists from history if we're continuing to be purchasing and for significant sums of money um, the works of male artists for the purposes of filling a gap in the collection. Um, I suppose on a more optimistic note, if you're thinking of buying women's art, um, the Guerrilla Girls are, are a fantastic sort of activist group who have been working around this issue of the representation of women artists in galleries and collections for decades, have proposed that um, perhaps in future, 
uh, when the dominance of white male artists has started to um, uh, diminish, that in fact, if you got him now and spent the same amount of money, 17.7 .7 million that was spent on a single Jasper Johns painting, you could have bought works by all of those women, and I can't remember how, I, if it was 67 or something like that, the numbers of individual works that you could have bought for that same amount of money. So um, check out those names. I haven't done an equivalent list of Australian artists, but um, I'm sure collectively we could come together with one and, and circulate it. But I think that's the lesson for us now is to think about uh, spending money in such a way as to restore or restore to uh, ensure the balance of artworks represented in the collections and the walls of our galleries and museums. So thank you.